just after midnight on July 17, 1918, Bolshevik troops perpetrated one of the most notorious war crimes of the 20th century, the massacre of the Romanov royal family. That night, at the express command of Vladimir Lenin, the deposed Tsar Nicholas II was executed alongside his wife, his son, his four daughters, and four loyal members of his entourage, including two women and five children. The massacre ensured that the monarchy was forever dead, but the blood on the hands of the Soviets would never wash off. The Romanov dynasty began in 1613 after a period of about 15 years following the death of Ivan the Terrible that's known as the Time of Troubles in Russia. There was famines, uh, there was economic collapse, there was disease. The Time of Troubles ends when Michael Romanov is crowned Tsar in 1613. He did not want to be Tsar. He is from a noble family, but not a, a family that he ever thought would be uh, on the throne. The Romanovs were descended from a wife of Ivan the Terrible. So he doesn't really have that much claim to the throne, but it was enough for the boyars. They wanted him there. They begged him to do it. The church was on his side, and he decided to take the job. He lasted a long time, and most importantly, he had a lot of kids. So he was made sure that the dynasty would continue. The Romanov dynasty lasts for over 300 years. It includes Peter the Great, it includes Catherine the Great. It includes a number of, of other czars, some better than others, some who tried to do major reform, some who were more conservative and did not. So Tsar Nicholas II was the last Russian Tsar. Nicholas was a uh, very devout man. He took great personal responsibility. And when World War I broke out, that responsibility manifested himself and he's stepping forward and saying, I'm gonna take over and lead the army. Now there are two problems with this. Number one is he wasn't a particularly brilliant military strategist, didn't have a whole lot of experience in that area. So that uh, was a problem. The second problem is when he left to go to the front, it really created a vacuum back home and his wife, uh, Alexandra, was uh, sort of expected to step in and just keep the home fires burning on a political level, which was uh, a problem for her. She didn't have that much political experience. She was also an outsider from the Russians' perspective. She was uh, German-born. One of the decisions that she made that got her into the most trouble had to do with Rasputin. Um, so Nicholas and Alexandra had a son, Alexei, who was a, a hemophiliac. A, a minor cut or a fall, uh, which you'd expect for a kid, could actually be fatal in the case of, uh, of hemophilia. Both Nicholas and Alexandra just lived in fear of their son's um, safety, and so they spent a, a considerable amount of time with doctors and with all sorts of things uh, worrying and trying to protect Alexei as best they could. Into the picture walks Rasputin, who was a mystic, um, a, a monk, uh, a healer, uh, quite a dodgy character. There's a lot of uh, very uh, interesting backstory about him. But for some reason, and no one knows exactly how, he did seem to have the ability to stop the, the flow of blood when Alexei was bleeding. And he could do that certainly in person. I think there's one instance where even over the phone he was able to, to stop an episode of bleeding uh, simply by, by talking to the boy. There was a lot of mistrust of Rasputin, some of it well-founded, uh, if you look at some of the things he was uh, attempting to do. But basically it just, it was a bad situation where she was uh, uh, found to be, you know, wanting because of the company she was keeping. And in her case, all she was really trying to do is protect her son and protect her family. Russia, as a general rule, in the late 19th century is behind. It's behind the rest of Europe. It's the last country to abolish serfdom. Uh, it, it, the population is less literate than the rest of Europe is, relatively speaking. Uh, it isn't as economically uh, sound. Uh, the inequality is uh, larger there than elsewhere. All noble families, for the most part in Europe, are wealthy, but the Romanov royal family was extravagantly wealthy relative to uh, the rest of the population. So if you, at the time, if you go to these places, the, the beach towns like Nice, there's these Russian princes that are there and they are loaded in, in the way that now we would think of uh, like a sheik from Saudi Arabia or something would have money. The, the Russian nobles were loaded. That's what everybody knew at the time. And a problem with this is that most of Russia was uh, agrarian, uh, peasant farmers, and they didn't have any money. Uh, 
On the eve of the First World War, the Russian Empire under the autocratic Romanovs was perhaps the least prepared of the powers that went into the conflict. Uh, Russia was backward militarily, politically. It was unstable. It had been racked since the late 19th century by social divisions, extreme poverty, um, an autocratic nobility that were out of tune completely with the workings of a modern state. Um, so it's not surprising that as a consequence of the stresses of the war, Russia should descend into civil war, into revolution, um, the, the, the Marxist Bolshevik revolution that swept away the Romanov dynasty. The family ends up, they were moved around repeatedly because the White Army and the Red Army were fighting and there were, there were different territories were being lost and gained. So they were living sort of on the road and never really knew uh, where their captors were going to take them next. But they end up in a house. The house where they're being held is called the House of the Special Purpose, which is a wonderfully morbid Russian expression for what it is, which is a prison. So after midnight, the, the order is given out to execute the royal family. They're brought down to the basement. A gentleman named Yakov Yurovsky, who wrote a first-person account of how he killed the royal family, is in charge of this. And basically, they shoot everybody. But because the women had diamonds and jewels sewn into their uh, dresses, they didn't die right away. So they had to go in with bayonets and finish the job. So it's this, not only did they execute them, they bungled us royally. They want nothing left. They want no monarchy. They want to make sure that the Romanov dynasty is dead. The execution of the Rom Romanovs was something that the Soviets felt, I'm sure, that they had to do. They had to change the tide of history. Um, the Romanovs represented everything that was in Russia's past. Uh, they were not just leaders of state. They were quasi-religious figures. They represented the ancient, unchanging Russia that the Soviets, that the Marxists, wanted to completely eradicate. When the Bolshevik Revolution took place, this was a major, th these were scary people. These were not nice people. Their actions were not uh, predictable and controllable in the way that uh, some of the, uh, the chess game that had been played in Europe for centuries with kings and queens and allegiances and so forth, all those rules were kind of thrown out the window. History sometimes goes full circle. Um, the, the social order that was destroyed by the First World War and the Russian Revolution in, in Russia had an elite noble class who were, they didn't speak Russian at home, they spoke French or they spoke English. And in terms of their origins, they were probably German or possibly British, they were very, there was nothing particularly Russian about them apart from the fact that they ruled over large parts of the Russian population. Um, they spent a great deal of their time outside of Russia. Um, places like the south of France were frequented by uh, the Russian aristocracy. And it's interesting how today we see the Russian oligarchs with their great wealth um, and they, you find them in London, you find them in the south of France, in huge villas and yachts. And um, Russia today has accepted um, the Romanovs and put them in a special place whereby they've been given sainthood, um, the remains were disinterred and they were reburied and the Russian president was there to see that done. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating to think that almost 70, 80 years later, that it's as if the communist revolution, the Marxist revolution, never happened. Now, one of the great ironies of the fall of the Romanovs and the Russian revolution is that the idea was to liberate the masses from the oppression of the, uh, the monarchical system. And all it did really was just install someone else in the position of, of authoritarian power. Stalin killed way more people than any of the czars ever had. And the system of secret police that he imposed so famously and so well was actually invented by Ivan the Terrible. Uh, so it too was a continuation of this monarchical kind of idea. And the absolute communist uh, theology or, or the underlying 
uh, philosophy of communism, which is we all share and this and that, was never achieved. They never even came close to achieving what they were supposed to achieve. They mostly replaced one form of autocratic oppression with another. How could a regime that purported to liberate the Russian peasants from oppression justify the slaughter of children? Under Soviet rule, the slaughter never stopped, reaching its peak under the terrible reign of Joseph Stalin. A nation born in cold blood can never quite wash off the stain.